Well, hello, everyone, and let me invite you to take God's Word, your Bible, and turn with me to the book of Hebrews in your New Testament. It sounds like an Old Testament book, but Hebrews is found in your New Testament. So Hebrews uh, chapter 11, the 11th chapter of Hebrews. We are living in a time of fear. Uh, We all know by now that a deadly virus has attacked the world. 2020 began with so much hope and so much promise. It was a brand new decade, just beginning. And we were thinking, this is going to be a great, great year. And yet something happened that changed everything, and that, of course, is this this virus. A germ began to spread rapidly, first in China, then across Europe, and then it came to the United States. And now, of course, it is a world pandemic, and it's changed everything. As a result, there has been loss of life and loss of health. Uh, The economy, the American economy and the world economy has been uh, impacted. We've shut our economy down. We've closed churches. Millions of people, 26 million as of right now and counting, 26 million people in America have lost their jobs. And we have locked down the country to face what our president has called an evil, invisible enemy, a plague, a pandemic, and we've shut down the country and we have sheltered ourselves in order to mitigate this virus. The good news is that it's working here in America and we're seeing signs that the virus is being contained, and we pray for the day and the day soon that this will be in the past. But as for now, it has created so much fear, anxiety in people's life. So this is a time for courage, especially if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are beginning a series of messages this weekend called Fearless. And we're going to be looking at some of the great stories of the Bible, in particular stories in the Old Testament. And these stories are real stories with real people, with real problems, just like you and me, but how they overcame obstacles and subdued kingdoms and uh, destroyed enemies because they were fearless in the face of anything and everything that they faced. We need today a bold confident, robust, muscular Christianity. Because there's no place for fear. Fear is a bondage. And we all feel fear from time to time. Fear feels like a prison, like a tyrant has locked us up and won't let us go. Fear will suck the life out of our souls. Fear will destroy our strength and take away our happiness. It's impossible to be happy and to be filled with fear at the same time. Fear will rob us of our joy and rob us of our happiness. It, it takes away uh, the life in life. And you know, fear accomplishes absolutely nothing. My friend Max Locato writes these words, fear never wrote a symphony or a poem, negotiated a peace treaty, or cured a disease. Fear never pulled a family out of poverty or a country out of bigotry. Fear never saved a marriage or a business. Courage did that. Faith did that. People who refused to consult or cower to their timidity did that. But fear herds us into a prison, and slams the doors. That's a vivid picture, isn't it? Fear herds us into a prison and slams the doors. And yes, fear is an emotional and a spiritual bondage. We're held captive by our ravaged and anxious thoughts and worried minds. But can you imagine a life free of fear? 
living in the freedom from this bondage that is so deadly? Can you imagine living in peace rather than in panic or pandemonium in your life? Can you imagine a life that is an inner calm rather than chaos? Is it possible? Is it even possible to live a life like this? And the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Because God has told us again and again in the scripture, do not be afraid. Again, over and over in God's word, multiple times, over 365 times, one for every day of the year, do not be afraid. Do not fear. God knows that we face fears, and God knows that we have anxious hearts and mind. So he promises us that we can break the chains, the bondage of fear in our lives, that we can live in faith rather than in fear. He shows us in his word how we can live a fearless life. Since I was a small boy, I have loved the stories of the Bible the stories of faith, when my grandfather would read the scriptures to me when I was just a small child, and he would speak to me and share with me those great stories of of David conquering the giant Goliath and of the great Daniel who lived through a lion's den experience. And, And he also told me about this story of Moses who stood up to the most powerful man on earth who was a Pharaoh. We begin with this story of Moses, this man among men, a liberator, a lawgiver, and leader. The man who grew up in Egypt as the adopted son of Pharaoh, though he was Jewish, a Hebrew, he was adopted into the family of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth. And yet, at a certain time in his life, Moses made a bold, fearless choice. And that choice is described in the text that uh, I asked you to find earlier, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read it, beginning in verse 24. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He was not afraid of the wrath of the king or the power of Egypt. And he stood fearlessly, courageously in the face of this king. And there came a day when he said, let my people go. This story of Moses strengthens our faith and reminds us that we can break every chain in our lives, including the bondage of fear, and live in the fullness and the promise of God. You see, God promised Moses and the children of Israel a promised land, a beautiful land where they would live in abundance, but they were in slavery in Egypt, and God had a plan of getting them out. Now, we need to start with the fact that Moses, at first, was an abject total failure, and here's how. As a young man, one day he walked on uh, a Hebrew uh, slave being abused, mistreated by an Egyptian. Moses was so angry in a fit of rage, he killed the Egyptian. And then to cover up his crime and to hide his sin, he buried that Egyptian in the sand. But the cover up didn't last very long. It never does, does it? The cover-up doesn't last very long. The Bible says that whoever conceals a transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You know, when we try to cover our transgressions, 
our mistakes, ultimately, they come out of the ground, and that's what happened. What God covers, God covers what we uncover, but God will uncover what we try to cover. And that's what happened to Moses. It all came apart. And Moses, the prince of Egypt, a man raised as the son of the king, now is a fugitive and he flees into the wilderness, into the desert, to the backside of nowhere in a far away place, as far away as he could hide from the wrath of the king. Now, someone said that Moses spent the first 40 years of his life learning to be a somebody with all the power, the success of being royalty. And he was trained in the schools of the Egyptians. And he was a powerful man. We're told in history that he was a military leader. That's the first 40 years of his life. But once this happened, once Moses committed the crime and covered it up, and it all came uncovered, and he ran for his life, he spends the next 40 years on the backside of the desert as a nobody, a nowhere man. Like the Beatles sang it, he's a real nowhere man living in his nowhere land. Isn't he a bit like you and me? Well, that was Moses. Now he's a nobody. He has nothing. He's in the desert. He's living in isolation. Talk about a quarantine. He's now a shepherd. And one day he goes out to shepherd his sheep and he sees a bramble bush, a scraggly bush, and Suddenly, out of nowhere, that bush ignites. It was as though it was nuked, and it began to burn. Well, that's one thing. It wasn't just a flash fire. It continued to burn. It was a burning bush. And ultimately, as Moses drew near to see what was going on with this bush, he heard the voice of God calling him to come near. Take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And there Moses at this burning bush encountered the living God, the great I am, which is the personal, eternal name of God. This is no generic God, just the God of anyone or anything. This is the God of all gods, the one true God. And Moses now is called to go back to Egypt and to deliver to be the liberator, the emancipator of the people of Israel and to get them out. Moses didn't want to go, but God's call compelled him. You know, when God calls you, when it's God's will for you to do something, he will equip you. He doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And Moses was prepared and in many ways now no longer powerful, successful. He's been humbled in the desert. He's been broken by this experience, but now he's full of the fire of God and he goes back to Israel. I said that Moses spent the first 40 years of his life learning how to be a somebody. He spent the second 40 years of his life. By the way, he's now 80 years of old. He's an octogenarian, but it's never too late for a new beginning. God still had a plan for his life. And so he spends the next 40 years learning what God could do with a person who's learned the first two lessons, how to be a somebody, how to be a nobody, and how God can use us when our lives are surrendered to him. So Moses, the fugitive, now goes back to Egypt. It's a new beginning with the fire of God, the great I am, the authority of God. And he walks right into the court of the Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Well, Pharaoh refused. He resisted. Who are you? And Moses reminded him who he is and who he was, that he was a child of the most high God. He's no longer fearful. He's no longer afraid. He stands against the wrath of the king. He stands up in the authority and the power of God. You know, this time in our lives, it could seem like a desert to some. You may be living in fear wherever you are. It feels like a wilderness. It feels like 
a desert, all this separation and all this isolation that so many, and yes, the fear that so many people are feeling these days. But Moses, because of God's power, stood up again. It's never too late to reset, to come back. And that's what he did. He, he went back. There was a comeback from Moses. And he goes to, to Egypt once again because now he's full of the power of God. Pharaoh began to harden his heart. In fact, it says many times as Moses confronted him, with that demand of God, let my people go, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And ultimately, listen to this, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Here's what happens. When a person resists and resists and resists the call of God, the word of God, when we resist salvation, In Jesus Christ again and again and again, what we do often we get good at and we begin hardening our hearts and we stiffen our hearts against God when we say no and no and no and that's what's happening to Pharaoh here. The scripture says, God says, my spirit will not always strive with a man and as Pharaoh is striving with him and resisting God's word to let my people go, his heart is hardening. It's like, it's like calluses you get on your hands. If you're working with your hands, when I was a, a college and high school athlete playing baseball, we would go out early and begin to hit. And, and I can remember my hands initially, they would, they would bleed almost and turn red and they were soft. But as we hit more and more, as we practiced more and more, our hands stiffened and there were calluses until you really didn't feel it anymore. Well, you know, you can get calluses on your soul as well. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 and verse 1, he who is often reproved and hardens his neck will suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because ultimately God said enough and he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And the same thing can happen to us as we resist the Lord. Moses kept coming to Pharaoh. God began to send plagues. And you may, you no doubt, if you know your Bible or even seen the Ten Commandments movie, you know that great plagues came upon the land of Egypt, upon the Egyptians. Ten plagues, in fact. And God is getting the Pharaoh's attention by now. And Moses keeps reappearing in the court of the Pharaoh saying, let my people go, let my people go. There was first the river of the Nile turned to blood and then there were frogs and there were insects and there was gnats and there was death to the livestock and ultimately the death of the firstborn of Egypt. But all along the way, Pharaoh began like Satan himself and Just push pause right there for a moment and let me say that Pharaoh is an illustration of the devil himself who presides over a world kingdom like Egypt. Egypt represents the world. Pharaoh represents the devil. And the devil has subtle strategies that try, in which he tries to keep us in bondage, to keep us in chains. Just like Pharaoh was holding on to the Hebrews, Satan tries to hold us captive. And so along came Pharaoh with a series of compromises. I believe that compromise may have taken more people down than any other sin in the world, compromise, because it's subtle, it's often unseen, and yet it is so powerful and so defeating. And four times, Pharaoh, like the devil, came with certain compromises, and we can find those back in the book of Exodus where we read the story. So just go ahead and take your Bible right now and turn back to the book of Exodus and chapter eight and look at verse 25 because here's the first compromise. 
Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, it would not be right for us to do so. For the offerings we shall sacrifice to the Lord, our God, are an abomination to the Egyptians. And if we sacrifice offerings abominable to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not stone us? So here's the first compromise. Pharaoh, like the devil today, comes and says, look, you can worship your God. You can have your religion but just stay here in Egypt. In other words, stay right here in the world. Do it here. The world, like Egypt, is filled with pleasures, powerful uh, possessions, and all the rest. And he said, you know, you can just stay. You can practice your religion right here. He's like the devil who's saying to so many people, have your religion, but leave your life in the world. To stay compromised in the world, sleep with the enemy, stay with the enemy. But what happens, they would still be in slavery, wouldn't they? Be very, very careful about compromising with the world, the world system. Staying in the world, staying close to the world. The Bible says, come out from among them and be you separate. The world system, not talking about people in the world that God loves, not talking about the world of nature, but the anti-God, anti-Christ system that is in the world today. The scripture says that we are not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds in Jesus Christ. We're to come out from the world. And God, if God is going to set you free, and he will set you free, but you've got to be willing to leave the world behind you. Take this world and give me Jesus. We used to sing an invitation song which says that we are to make a decision for Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me and the cross before me. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be willing to leave this world system and to follow Christ. It means making a clean break from the bondage of Satan and sin and this world. And if you're going to follow Christ, you must be willing to turn your back on the world. So Moses said, no, no, no. Mo said no to the compromise of staying in Egypt. But so more plagues came and and the, and the negotiation goes further. Uh, Pharaoh comes back like the devil. He comes back again with another strategy. Look in verse 28 of this same chapter. Chapter uh, 8, 28. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go to sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, but you must not go very far away. Now that's a compromise. Pharaoh is saying, Moses, okay, you can leave Egypt. You can go out into the wilderness, but don't go very far because you may want to come back. You don't want to go too far with this thing, Moses. Don't be so radical. And that's what the devil says to so many of us today. This is a compromise. We hear it all the time. We hear it in our hearts. We hear it in our heads. Look, it's okay to come out of the world and follow Jesus. Just don't go too far with this thing. Don't be a freak. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fanatic. You can have religion. You can be a Christmas and Easter kind of person. But, you know, you're not going to commit all the way. You don't want to be, uh, go overboard with this thing. So that's compromise. Uh, you don't have to go to church every week to worship God. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to share your faith. In other words, just status quo. Don't go very far. Remember I said compromise will defeat you and it will damage your testimony. Because what happens so often is we still live in the world. We don't get very far from the world and our friends know it, our family knows it, everybody knows it. We've got one foot in Egypt. Uh, one foot 
uh, in the wilderness. We're living a compromised life. We just don't take it far enough. We're afraid that someone would think we're some kind of a religious fanatic. Don't go all the way. And yet, when we're called to follow Christ, we're called to go all in and to leave the world and go fully forward to follow the Christ courageously. A third compromise came, more plagues came, and once again, Pharaoh is ready to talk. So in chapter 10, you just want to turn over to chapter 10 in Exodus. Once again, Pharaoh comes with a compromise. Uh, chapter 10, look at beginning in verse 8. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to the Pharaoh, and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. He said, okay, go. Leave Egypt, go serve the Lord your God, but which ones are to go? Who's going? And Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. You see what's happening here now? The devil comes along like Pharaoh, and he says to us, okay, leave Egypt, go, but don't go very far. But if you're going, and you're going all the way, don't take your family with you. Don't take your possessions with you. Don't take your young, don't take your old, just you, the men, you go. Moses responded to that, that negotiation by saying no. Said, our families are going with us. We're not gonna leave our families behind. Satan hates the family. He has always sought to destroy and to divide families, husbands and wives, and parents from their children. And we, of course, see that happening in our day. We see Satan attacking our children, our grandchildren. The, the heat is on. The suicide rate among teenagers is off the chart, it's like something we've never seen before. And, and the, immediate, uh, the media onslaught for the minds of our kids is, is full throttle ahead. And we must fight for our families. We must take our kids with us. Don't fall from this compromise. Lead your children to Christ. Lead your family forward out of Egypt, out of the world, and to follow Jesus with all your heart. Don't compromise. One problem we've got so often with our children is we've lived compromised lives ourselves. Our kids know they can spot phoniness. They can spot compromise in our lives. And so the best thing we can do for our children is to live a godly life in the power of God's Spirit so that they see Christ in us, so that they see the testimony that what we say we believe, we actually believe, that we fight this good fight of faith. Our children do not expect perfection but they do expect us to be real, to be authentic. And when we come out of the world, when we go all the way forward with God, our children see it and know it, but I'm challenging you today, don't compromise with your children. Don't just take your children to church or drop them off. Once we get back to buildings and back to coming to the fellowship of, of, of the people of God, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, don't just drop your kids off and go somewhere else, drinking a coffee somewhere, but lead your children to church. Let them see Jesus in you. Take your children with you. Let's be a generation. Come Coming out of this thing, as we reset and as we rebound and revive spiritually, let's be the kind of parents and grandparents and family members which says we will not allow the world, the devil, to have our children. No compromise. And there's one final compromise. More plagues come. And Pharaoh is ready to deal again. You know, he keeps hardening his heart every time. He says, no, he hardens his heart. And uh, so in this same passage of Scripture, let me get right back to it in uh, Exodus chapter 9. Stay with me now. For in verse 24, Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go serve the Lord with your little ones. Take everybody. They can go with you. Watch this. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. 
Leave your possessions behind. Leave your money behind. Leave your land behind, but not just your land, your livelihood. Leave it all behind. You know what Moses said? That great, bold, courageous, non-compromiser, full of the fire of God, he said, no, we're going. We're leaving Egypt. We're going to go far into the desert, far, far from here. We're out of here. We're going to the promised land, ultimately. He said, we're taking our wives, our daughters, our sons, our old pe people, our grandparents, every head, every hair, and we're taking our possessions with us. We're taking the herds. We're taking everything. Do you see the temptation is follow Christ, but just leave your business back in the world. Separate your spiritual life from your secular life. Or, or leave your money in your pocket. Don't, don't give generously to the work of Christ in your church. Just hold on to your money. God has called every one of us to love Christ and to love the work of Christ. Jesus established his church, and I want to challenge you not to leave your money or your business or your secular life back there in Egypt somewhere but that as you follow Christ, you come with a full commitment. And that is to say, Lord, you have my life. You have my person. You have my possessions. You have my family. You have everything that, that you have given me. I give it back to you. I'm going, and I'm going all the way. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, the Lord of my family, and I'm not holding anything back from you. And when you live, when we live like that, the fear in our lives diminishes. It is destroyed. And we come out of bondage. We come out of Egypt. We come out of fear. And the chains are broken. And we live in the power of Christ. May God deliver us from the bondage of fear and any other kind of bondage. As we live a bold, bodacious life for Christ, a non-compromised life. And say, Lord, every nerve, every ounce, every inch of me and what I have, it belongs to you. And Satan can't have me. He can't have our family. He can't have my money. He can have none of this because, Lord, I'm giving it all to you. Come to the Lord in faith and the renewal of faith this very day. And you will see fear flushed out, and faith grow in your life. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed? For just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Christ into your life. For some, so many who are watching today, listening this moment, the Spirit of God has spoken to you, and you know that you're still living in the world. You're still in the land of Egypt, far from God. And you need Christ in your life. Jesus, the Savior. You see, Moses, we're told, for the reward of Christ. In advance, Moses saw what was coming. He knew what was coming. The Messiah was coming, and he believed in advance. And we believe now, looking back to what Christ has done by dying on the cross for our sins, to rise again on the third day, Jesus is Lord. And right now, where you are, bow your head and say, Lord Jesus. I invite you to come into my life. I want to leave this world behind. The world behind me, the cross before me. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. I repent of my sin. I receive you into my life. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. And for others to say, Lord, I, I'm a Christian, but I've been living in Egypt. One foot in the world, one foot in in the worship of Christ, I've been compromised. But I want to live an uncompromised, non-compromised life for my sake, for the sake of our family, our children, the legacy of your life. Come out of the world all the way. Go all the way forward with Jesus and just pray, Lord, I want to reset spiritually. I need revival. I want to rededicate my life to you. Decide today. Begin today to live this life of fearless, courageous faith. Lord Jesus, how we thank you 
for your word to us today. It is power. It is strength. It is life. Remove every fear. Strike down every sin and every idol in our lives. And may we live in the fullness and the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Many of you prayed a prayer of faith today. And for those of you who are trusting in Christ, many for the first time over the last number of weeks, we've seen over 6,000 people respond to the invitation online. And to all who respond, we want to send you a Bible. It is the New Believer's Bible. It's written with you in mind. It's the Word of God. The New Testament with study notes written by my good friend, Greg Laurie, and uh, it will help you grow in your faith. We will send it to you free of charge if you will do this. And that is to simply raise a hand right now. If you're watching a screen where there are hands there, just go ahead and start clicking and raising a hand, raise a hand. It's so good to be able to watch these hands go up. One, two, three, 10, 20, 50. Raise a hand right now. When I say one, two, three, go ahead and do it. One, two, three three, raise that hand and say, I'm trusting Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And many others, you rededicated your life today. You you want the reset. You want the renewal, the rededication. You want to come out of the world and be a non-compromised follower of Jesus. Not a not a compromised, half in, half hearted, half out kind of follower of Jesus, but all the way. Well, you also Uh, just raise a hand right now. And you can also, when you don't see a hand raised, you can text this number, 74788, 74788, I believe it's on the screen, I know it is, and text in the word, write in the word, click in the words, J-E-S-U-S. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved, J-E-S-U-S. So text this number, 74788, and then text Jesus. And you can register your decision. When we get your information, we'll be able to send you the New Believers Bible. We'll also send you my book, New Life in Christ, which is exploring the essentials of the Christian faith. It will help you live for Christ going forward. We want you to have it free of charge. Absolutely our love and our gift to you. Thank you for joining us today at Prestonwood Online. We're coming to your home in this unusual time in the world, yet we're seeing God do some amazing things in our lives, aren't we? Keep praying, Prestonwood Church family, keep praying, keep giving, keep serving the Lord. And those of you from around the world who have joined us, please know how loved you are, how welcomed you are, and we look forward to joining you again next time when Prestonwood Online comes to your home, to your house, and to your life. God bless you.